Hi, this is Beatles author Mark Lewison, and you're listening to Things We Said Today with Ken Michaels and Steve Marinucci. Hello, hello, and welcome once again to a Beatles show called Things We Said Today. This is a weekly show in which we focus on what's going on with the Beatles, news-wise. I'm Ken Michaels, one of the co-hosts of the show, best known for my syndicated radio program called Every Little Thing, and I'm joined by my co-host, the man who writes for Beatles Examiner, who's more on top of the news than anybody else I know when it comes to the Beatles, and that, of course, is Steve Marinucci. Hi, Steve. Hi, Ken. Hey, everybody. How are you doing? On today's show, we're going to give our own review of a new release on the Beatles, and it is their double CD that just came out called On Air, Live at the BBC, yep. Volume 2. And uh, we're just going to get our own take of this particular collection and what we think of it and why. And I'm curious to know what, what you think of this particular compilation, Steve. I'm, you know, I have to say, first of all, that when the first album came out, when the original live in, at the uh, BBC album came out in 94, uh, I was th- absolutely, positively thrilled, jumping through hoops. Hmm. I loved it. I absolutely loved it. I mean, the set, uh, these are the tracks that that I had. I mean, this was some of the first stuff, I should say, unreleased, if you get my drift, mm-hmm. that I ever really was interested in and that I'd ever heard, you know, along with the Get Back outtakes that everybody, or the Get Back album that everybody heard. But this stuff was just, uh, you know, the stuff that the earliest Beatle bootlegs went crazy over. Right. Um, you know, and I I loved it then. I And I absolutely, I never thought that the Beatles would have been hip enough to release it. And this one, because of the fact that it's there's so much happened that has happened since, and I'm thinking the the Great Dane set, which God knows every everybody I seem to have talked to has it. I have one that way or one. Another. Yeah. So this one just didn't have the the thrill. I, I won't say I don't like it because I do because there's so many there are a lot of things to like about it, but it just didn't have the the boom boom impact that the first one did. And why do you suppose that is? Well, I think, number one, we're all older. I think I, I, if they had done this a little closer to 94, it probably would have been better. I think that the Internet has, has kind of killed it a little bit, not because everybody went out and... Well, I mean, because a, a lot of collectors had this stuff. There are people, obviously, you know, your your Walmart shoppers and all that stuff that don't have this that are going to say, hey, what is this? I never heard this before. And they're going to be very excited. And Beatles fans have a definite right to be excited because the sound quality on this is better than, you know, the stuff the, uh, is better than the bootlegs. Right. Uh, and in the case of the first album, which they also remastered and reissued, there are some definite changes there between that and this, uh, between that and the original version. So there's plenty of reasons to to get it i just don't think that given the i don't know given the time frame given the you know what's happened since that it just doesn't have the impact as it used to well you know there's a lot of things to consider here first of all there's always going to be thankfully new generations of fans who are just discovering the beatles who are not actively going to look for bootlegs or what's on the internet Mm -hmm. and for them to have a new collection and it says beatles on it they're thrilled and the sound quality of the new collection, just like uh, the the remastered Volume 1 of uh, the collection that came out in 94, sounds really good. It's better than what I've heard on, on most of the bootlegs. Oh, but, yeah, absolutely, without question. And, look, I, and I'm, I'm thrilled that anything Beatles comes out in this day and age, stuff that hasn't been released before. But by the same token, and I hate to say this because... When it comes to the BBC recordings, and I have always, always been thrilled about those recordings because of the songs that they 
perform for BBC Radio that they didn't release for EMI. Right. And that, for me, will always be the most exciting part. Not that you shouldn't give a lot of credit to all the other recordings that they mm -hmm. made, but there were 36 songs that they did for BBC Radio that they didn't release for EMI. And on that first collection that came out in 94, 30 of them were on there. Right. Whereas on the new collection, there's two. Mm -hmm. And everything else are songs that they did release, and they're nice to hear, and it's great to hear them, and it's exciting to hear different versions of Beatles songs anyway. And also, you know for a fact that in many cases, up until the Top Gear program, that this was all direct to tape. No overdubbing. You know, this was the Beatles live. And for a lot of reasons, and when you hear so many complaints about you couldn't hear them live when they came over to the States in 64, 65, and 66 mm -hmm. during the whole Beatlemania period, well, this is what they sounded like in most cases, not all, but in most cases, without an audience and just going direct to tape, really live in the studio. Right. So it's exciting for me in that regard. Yeah, I've you know I've always kind of thought of of these recordings as unofficial outtakes. Um, hmm. We all like we all I think most of us love hearing outtakes, no matter how bad quality they are, and there are some that have been absolutely horrible. And no matter how little there's the, the difference is, and that's one way I've always kind of approached these as kind of outtakes. One of the ones on the new collection that fits that bill completely is And I Love Her, uh, which has a kind of a different sound, although not a different arrangement, obviously, but a little different sound than the studio version. And so, and that is, that's one of the, you know, that's one of the very big qualities, uh, great qualities about this collection. Hmm. That's my, I mean, as a, as a collector, you know, they've always, I've always appreciated that, that, these aren't exactly the studio recordings, and they always there's always some little differences. Well, the difference is between the BBC stuff and the studio. The differences as, there, as very well there should have been because, as you said, they were live. Yeah, those differences can make it all the more interesting. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, especially when it comes to uh, not having the harmonica on certain songs. Right. When you go back to the first volume, I think "Thank You, Girl" was one of the most exciting recordings on there. Because it's without the harmonica, and it has a different feel to it that way. Much the same way when you listen to Volume 2, a song like Chains. It's just very different to hear it without a harmonica. Or um, what other song was it? There's a place. You know, there are certain songs like those where you're used to hearing a harmonica in the song, and it's just not there, and it has more of a band feel. I don't know, more of a live feel to it. Mm -hmm. And even though you call these outtakes, as far as I'm concerned, in many cases, they were good enough to go just like this. Right. I mean, they and, were and that I good. Use the, the word outtakes very loosely because they're not the the master takes. They're not the the, the release master takes. Mm. So, yeah, don't don't get hung up on that on that outtake, you know, description. It's it's just a way to approach them as something completely, you know, something a little different. Right. So, I just think that when they put together this particular compilation, they had to put a few songs in there that they didn't release for EMI. And then it was a tough job picking the other material. And I noticed one of the few things that I find disappointing about this, and there's only a few things really, is that there's nothing to represent uh, the first two BBC radio appearances that Pete Best was in. Well, I can, and, we can probably guess why that is. You know, uh, that's not, su not totally surprising. Well, you're saying because of the sound quality? Well, that and the fact that I think that would have... I, I think there's probably still that brotherhood there, and they, you know, they just want to keep things as it as it is. I I don't know. Uh, it, that, that's a that's a good question. Why they why they didn't do that? I don't know. That's one of the questions that I wish we had asked Kevin Howlett. But I know that there was uh, an interview that he gave in Billboard magazine, where he said that they were very concerned about the sound quality, right. and all the bootlegs that I've heard of those first two shows. It's pretty rough quality, but it's still good. And uh, for historical purposes, I don't care. <laughs> you know, and not everything in that in the new collection is perfect quality. No, but they're There's, certainly good enough. Yeah, it, it is. I'm I, I'm thinking, for example, I got a woman. Sounds a little rougher than some of the other tracks. Uh huh. 
but it's not obviously it's not that much below but there is a bit a little bit of a there is a little bit of a difference there and and you know and that may have been well like you say that's probably part of it but that also may be just kind of a you know kind of a, a reason to say oh they weren't as good quality let's not use them but you know i don't know that's it's an inter- that's a very interesting question yeah not only that but um and you learn this from all the Beatle books that have come out there, and especially Kevin Howlett's new book. Um, 1965, they only appeared on BBC Radio performing their songs on one show. Mm-hmm. The Beatles invite you to take a ticket to ride. Which, yeah. And there were a couple of songs from that particular show on the first collection, on Volume 1. There's nothing from it on here. Everything in this collection was 1963 and 64, so there's nothing from 62 and 65. And that's fine. It's very focused that way. But the 65 show, because it was their last time performing songs on that show, right. they should have put something in there. And one very interesting song that they did was The Night Before. And even though that particular performance sounds almost identical to the release version from the Beatles, they never did that song live. Right. So I think for that reason, maybe something from that particular show, especially that song, should have been on there. But everything here is, is like I said, very focused, 63 and 64, as it should be, because those were the, the busiest years for the Beatles on BBC Radio. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, there's no, yeah, there's no question there that, uh, yeah, they, I, had, they had everything pretty well segmented on this one. Um, what did you think, uh, you know, uh, surprisingly, I was listen- when I was listening to it, I didn't really pay attention to them the first time, but listening to it, uh, you know, in preparation for the show, I found found myself liking the interview segments a lot more. What do you uh, think? Wh- what's your feeling about the interview segments? I think they're wonderful, and and I think that um, it's very it's paced very well, because all the interview clips, all the banter between the Beatles with the the studio DJs, the the program DJs, were kind of short. You know, it didn't go on for too long, and then it went right into the song. It was just paced very well. Um, I like that aspect of it. And one of the things that I think is important to bring out, it's not just about this particular collection, but the BBC recordings should should be more important to Beatle fans than many of them are aware. Because not only did the appearances, especially in 63, it was such a pivotal year for them in England, The fact that they were on the radio that much gave them so much exposure. That's what propelled them, one of the reasons, anyway, to become the big stars they were in England, and from there it was the world. But when you listen to these these radio appearances from the Beatles, they're not just selling their music. They're selling the package that was the Beatles. Right. And that means their personalities, their sense of humor, their rapport with the DJs. All that was important in their popularity initially. And there are some really marvelous. There's some really marvelous segments in these BBC recordings, and I'm gl- I, I initially, like I said, I wasn't real thrilled about about them. But after you know, when you listen to them, um, the one about Harry in the box, I think is is wonderful. I, that's just, that's just fun to listen to. But uh-huh. uh, and but there's this you know that kind of thing all the way through. They they were also very relaxed. With uh, with the BBC disc jockeys, especially Brian Matthews, mm-hmm. um, who, as Kevin Howlett said, is still doing it today, still doing a weekly show on BBC Radio. God bless him. And um, it's really wonderful the way they got along with the the, the uh, disc jockeys. Uh, yeah, it's just it's just great, and that's I think one of the best parts of the, of the CD. Yeah, I just love uh, just their sense of humor mm-hmm. coming into play. And just imagine if you were living in England and you were getting into the Beatles then and you you had a chance to listen to them almost every single week on the radio and all of a sudden you hear the different voices and you're trying to picture in your mind what each one looks like if you haven't seen them live. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it just added so much of a dimension to them. Most bands in the history of rock have one lead singer or one spokesman and -hmm. that person does all the talking for them. Here you have every member of the group talking and their personality shown through right. through these appearances. And that was just so important. And the other thing that that I'm just now thinking about, because of those 36 songs that the Beatles did for BBC Radio that they didn't release for EMI, when you think about 36 songs, that's a lot of material. 
that you can look at as three albums worth mm -hmm. of material. It also makes me think that since the Beatles were under contract to give us two albums a year, imagine if they had to do more. Imagine if they said, you've got to give us three albums a year. What you probably would have gotten were these songs. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Because I, another thing about this collection, and especially the first one, is that these were the songs that the Beatles were doing live on stage. And it also tells you the songs that they were discovering at that time, the songs that they liked, the mm -hmm. ones that really appealed to them. Yeah, and that's one of the, that's one of the, the interesting things, uh, you know, about the uh, the BBC sessions in general is that, uh, you know, any as you said, any one of these things could have ended up on an album, and, and it didn't. So yeah, and um, you know, I remember whenever I talk about the the BBC recordings. I always bring up the fact that a very interesting aspect of it all is that George Harrison got to sing lead vocals on a lot more songs than you would think, you know, based on what happened with the EMI catalog. And mm -hmm. having read Mark Lewison's book all these years, Tune In, one thing that he brings up there is that Brian Epstein really wanted George to get more vocals. And mm -hmm. when he became the manager, he was kind of pushing for that. And he thought that it would help sell the band even more. Instead of just having one lead vocalist here, you've got three, and actually four with Ringo, although he didn't get to sing lead on too many songs. But right. the fact that you've got John, Paul, and George sharing pretty much equally the vocals. When you listen to volume one, especially, of the BBC stuff, it's a lot of George there. A lot of George. Right. And so, and then, of course, as time went on, as the Beatles started doing more of their own original material on their own albums, and they weren't doing as many covers, and George couldn't write as prolifically as John and Paul, then the albums were dominated more by John and Paul. And George got two songs, maybe three. But when it came to when they were doing a lot of covers, George got equal time around this time. So I find it really interesting in, in that regard. But um, it's a fascinating thing, you know, just listening to all this stuff and realizing just what a great band they were. Yeah, and, and you know, an another mention would be of Ringo, the way Ringo was so personable and, and uh, you know, and the, for example, on that pop profile, he comes across as a very warm guy, uh -huh. as, they all, as they all do. I mean, John talks about, in the interview, Brian Matthew specifically asked asked him about uh his political leanings and John kind of says uh, you know which was which was an interesting comment in light of what happened later right. but uh they all at that point you know things were, uh, were were about to change in their lives and it was and and so those pop profiles are also interesting i've heard comments from people saying they kind of wish they had been on a separate disc mm I think if they'd been on a separate disc, you probably wouldn't have paid as much attention to them. Um, you might be right about that, but uh, I, I do kind of feel that it really slowed down the discs to end with two interviews each. Mm -hmm. You know, you're in this music mode. <laughs> you're hearing all this great stuff with some short clips in between of studio banter, and that's fine. And then you've got five-minute interviews each. Right. And it really slowed everything down. I love interviews. Uh, I'm fascinated by any interview with any of the Beatles. Mm -hmm. And these interviews are actually quite good. You know, yeah, they are. They are quite good. Uh, the thing that, that struck me about these particular interviews, and this was in 1965, is that they weren't the typical, you know, teen idol type questions. You know, what's your favorite color kind of question or you know, how do you like uh, American girls compared to British girls kind of thing. They were more intelligent questions. It was more about them as people, not just about their music career. And they also weren't giving the standard answers, um, the segmented answers that a lot of interviews would have would have gotten, which is really, I mean, I think that was really, that was really wonderful uh, that uh, they were that open I mean, I, I would think if somebody had if somebody had done the same kind of interviews today with Paul and Ringo, I don't think you'd have gotten those answers, some of those answers. But hmm, yeah. But um, you can tell. Even George Harrison said in his interview that um, he's bored with those kind of questions. What color are your teeth? Right. <laughs> you know, and um, 
just to get them talking about, like with John, how was he going to school Julian? You know, what kind of an education would he give someone like him? Right. Or uh, talk about Paul and different types of music that he's into. And mm -hmm. um, one of the most interesting things that I found, and it's actually quoted in Kevin Howlett's book, was a quote from George when he was just talking about how with a lot of bands, there's a lot of emphasis on the lead guitarist and how flashy he is or the solos that he, that he does or on the mm -hmm. lead singer. But with the Beatles, it was more a collective thing, more, more a whole, a whole collection, a collaborative right. thing. And that's a, such an intelligent thing to say. And uh, that's 1965, George. Mm -hmm. And you could tell because George was the one who I think got the most weary of the mania. I mean, more quickly than the others. Right. And uh, so he kind of welcomed a more intelligent conversation like this one. Mm -hmm. so I think give, they all did. I mean, yeah. Paul, you could see a little of the wear, hear, hear a little of the weariness in Paul's voice, too. Right. Um, he was kind of, they were, he was kind of getting, you know, I mean, they'd, they'd been going through a couple of years of that stuff, and, and you know, certainly it, it it got to them. It was, you know, not having all the, I mean, as Paul said in the interview, you know, it used to be nice being able to do anything you wanted to do, and, you know, he couldn't do that anymore, and so. Right, yeah. And also in various, in you know, in various com in comments on the first in the, on the first set, you could hear the difference, the way they approached that question the first time around versus the, the pop profile, which was a little later. So that's, yeah, it's an evo there's an evolution going on there, which is kind of interesting, too. Yeah, it's evolution in music and an evolution in them changing as people mm -hmm. so rapidly. Right. So, But, uh, but o I mean, overall, obviously, this is something you're going to want to get you know it'd be interesting be interesting to see how many people go for the uh collection versus the the two the four disc collection versus the the uh separate discs or go for the the best buy one with the with the photo cards um but um either way i think the i think on air is probably is something you definitely need to have yeah my question to you would be do you think there ever will come a time when either will get another collection and at this point, since almost all of the unreleased songs have been released now, right? what remains? I mean, uh, or will we have a box set? Because the thing is, you know, I think that a collection like this is great for the casual fan or someone just getting into the Beatles now. Right. I know there are hardcore fans that want the box set out to have everything released. Now, how many people out there outside of the hardcore fans need to have all the versions of From Me to You? I think they did 16, 16 recordings of From Me to You. And I think, please, please I think me. There, I think there definitely will be another collection. And I think you, the reason is that it was what you said earlier is that you know there are still songs, unreleased songs that they haven't used. Yeah, but there's only three left. Well. And they are from 62, and they all have Pete Best on drums, whether or not that matters at all. And so far, the sound quality of the recordings that do exist are a substandard to the others. Mm -hmm. So then you have, to, you have to think about the songs that haven't been released so far of the songs that they did release in their EMI catalog, songs mm -hmm. like I Should Have Known Better, for example. Or I think if they, had, if, they go, if they do another set, it will be geared more towards complete radio shows rather than... Um, cut up songs like they've done. That's very interesting. I was going to bring that up to you because I was just thinking, since we've been told, and it's an amazing feat that the Beatles pulled off, one of many, but there's mm -hmm. that July 16th, 1963 date that Kevin Hallett was talking about with us, mm -hmm. where they had three Pop Go the Beatles shows that they recorded all in one day. Right. And they recorded 18 songs, although actually 17 because they repeated She Loves You. But put that in one CD. <laughs> that would be pretty fascinating. To well, know, I think any you know, any of the full shows would be fascinating. Yeah. No matter, I mean, no matter. They don't necessarily have to be those three, but I think the continuity and the and the, you know, and the, just the pace of the whole show. It'd be nice to hear. I mean, if you obviously if you have the bootlegs, the Great Dane set or the the Purple Chick set, you've heard them. Hmm. 
but I think I think that would be fun. I think that would be the way to go. And the question is whether Apple will do it. And you know the the indication we got from Kevin Hollett was right now no, but mm. that doesn't mean a few years down the road they won't do it. And so you know, but I mean it's hard to say one way or the other which what they will do. But um, I it's honestly, an interesting. I think it's an interesting yeah. idea, and I and I actually like that idea to to do to do the full shows. I'm almost kind of sorry they didn't do that here, or at least give one or two shows. You know, Maybe give a third disc with a, with one or two shows, but that's me. I'm kind of surprised that they did this to begin with, because you couldn't convince me back in 1994 that they were thinking, well, sometime in the future we'll do another compilation, because they put so much into that first one. Right, and that's one of the reasons. That's one of the reasons why the impact of this set didn't hit me as hard as the first one. I mean, the first one was just, for one, the first one, as I said, was such a surprise. None of us saw it coming, hmm. and it, it just it, because there was no there was no internet craziness as there was, as there is now, and everything there's no there are hardly any secrets anymore. I mean between Amazon and you know am, listings showing up on Amazon and all this stuff and it's just it's crazy, yeah. it's absolutely nuts. And I know from when I first read uh, Mark Lewison's The Beatles Live book, which I always cherish, and I give him so much credit for all the work he put into that book, seven years of research. Right. And at the end of each year, there was a list of all the songs that the Beatles did live that year. And you'd look at all the early years, because those are the most fascinating, and all the stuff that they performed live that they never did release at all for EMI. And you kind of wish that, you know, all these other songs that you heard about through 1963, if we could only get some recordings of those songs. Yeah, I've, and, I've written on that before. And there's some wonderful, I mean, the, the, some of the songs are just absolutely astounding. You can't imagine what they would be sounding like. Uh, it, would be, it would be wonderful to, to have a time machine and go back in time and be able to listen to some of those. Yeah, even if they're all live at the Star Club quality. <laughs> <laughs> you know right. that that particular collection I find more fascinating now. Yeah, and you know I I, I really I mean there's a I don't mean to go off the subject here, but I really wish they weren't so down on that thing. They really that is such a great collection. It really really is. Mm. Maybe in time somebody will there'll be some technology available that can make it sound. A little better than it does, but I mean, I didn't think it sounded as bad as all that anyway. But it, I, that would really be nice to get that back out and get, you know, as complete a tape as we can get and and, and get it done. I, I mean, that's it's really is a it, a good album. It really is. Yeah, but to get a taste of what the Beatles did at that time <laughs> for songs that they were doing live in '63 or before that, a song like "Words of Love," they were doing since the late 50s. So mm -hmm. to, to get a feeling of that, the best way to do that is by listening to the BBC recordings. They right. really are something to treasure. What did you think of the uh, Words of Love video? I liked it. You know, it caught me by surprise. I didn't know they were going to make one for the video. Right. But I, didn't the... E I didn't either. And uh, I, I was, eh, okay. Um, I, it, the uh, little uh, pencil and, and uh, the uh, pencil additions, the coloring to it, I just kind of went, eh, okay, okay. I would have really, however, liked them to have done another song that wasn't on the two CDs, or the, uh, that wasn't on the two sets, I should say. I wish they had pulled something else out of the fire and done that. Why would um, they do that if they're trying to sell this collection? Because it would have it would have been a, a little boost for the for the fans, and it would have boosted the you know the collection as a whole. Would have boosted interest to have another song out there. I just, I think, I wish they had. I kind of wish they had done that. But what can I say? But but if you want them to buy this double CD and you're you want there to be a video for a song that's not on it, that doesn't make sense. <laughs> no, it doesn't. It doesn't make. Maybe it doesn't make marketing sense, but it makes fan sense. In other words, the the diehard fans would have appreciated it. So because. I'm just I'm just saying as a as a as a crazy fan that I would have loved to have seen another song. Uh huh. But so. the the animation in there where they have 
uh, Mal Evans and Neil Aspinall mm-hmm. driving the van, I thought that was really touching. Mm-hmm. I mean, it that was a way. Was. Um, yeah, it was. That was a way to represent them in the video. Right. Give them a, give them a little a little homage to them. Yeah, and there's um, a mixture of black and white and color footage, and I like how it all blends together. Certain footage of the Beatles has been overused a lot, certainly where you see the Beatles in the studio and you got Paul shaking his his arms, you know, and you know, you know that scene. Mm-hmm. That particular thing, it's been it's been done <laughs> way too much. And um, Ringo shaking his head. Yeah, that kind of thing. So, right. but I'm glad they made a video for it. And I, I've seen that it's gotten a lot of hits on YouTube. So, yes, it has. It, it yeah, it got a lot. It got a lot uh, before it hit YouTube because there was a, a site that had it um, for about uh, a day, I think. And then uh, once it hit YouTube, things went through the roof. Hmm. But um, so, but yeah, I'm I'm glad I'm glad they did that. I'm I'm glad that they that they did that. Ho- hopefully, maybe there'll be something else. I don't know. Yeah, but I do agree with you. They should just do complete shows. You agree with me? Oh, my God. <laughs> it's happened many times, and I'm sure it'll happen again. Oh, okay. Sometimes I think maybe it might be a good idea to just put together all the Pop Go the Beatles shows mm-hmm. and make that a collection, that mm-hmm. kind of thing. Just group it by the name of the show. We just mentioned um, all together there were 30 songs on the first collection that they didn't release for EMI. There's two on the new one. And actually... Um, there's a song, there's a couple songs on the new collection on, on, um, on air that were released already. You probably know that, but, right. um, I'll follow the sun was from the program top gear. And that was issued on the baby. It's you CD single. And also lend me your comb was released on the Beatles anthology volume one. All right. So of the 36 songs <laughs> that the Beatles, uh, performed on BBC Radio that they didn't release. 33 have now come out. Okay. So there's three still that have not been released. So you have an idea of any of them? Um, I'm thinking that one of the ones is the Joe Brown song. There you go. That's one of them. That's a um, picture of you. Picture of you, yeah. That's mm-hmm. one of them. Which actually, which I really like. And I'm, I kind of wish they had thrown that. Obviously, you know, be, because of sound quality because of sound quality and also probably because of the pete best thing well, we That's don't probably know one of the reasons we don't really know so the other two you want me to tell you yes besame mucho and from the very first bbc show that they were on teenagers turn dream baby the roy orbison song right so those are the only three that remain so it'd be nice for it to officially come out commercially mm-hmm. but uh, that may never happen or it might sometime in the future you never know i would guess the dream baby was probably well probably i, I would think maybe at least two two of those songs were very thoroughly discussed and that would be dream baby and um a picture of you picture of you mm. picture of you because of the the joe brown connection um possibly since he's been friends with the beatles and especially george right I think probably Best of My Mucho is probably not one of those. They, uh, it's just kind of, it's just a, it was an odd choice then, and I think it's an odd choice now. It was an odd choice in their first session for EMI. Right. <laughs> so right. it must have meant something to them that they did it on the first BBC uh, program and also the first session at EMI. Mm-hmm. But just to complete the collection, it would be nice if they all came out. Mm-hmm. So that puts yeah. a wrap on this show. We encourage you to write to us with your comments if you have any thoughts about the new collection on yeah, air. Tell us, tell us that we're tell us that we're all wrong and it's you know it's fantastic or it's awful or we, let us let us hear what you think. See, we don't mind criticism like that. Steve has a stomach made of steel; he can handle any criticism. I, on oh, the I other hand, all the time. you know, I fall apart though when that happens. So. Oh, okay. Kind of be in the middle if you can. But you can write to us at our email address, which is things we said today radio show at gmail.com. You can also get in touch with us a number of ways. We have our own Facebook page for things we said today. I have an email address, which is every little thing at att.net. You can also check out my own website, kenmichaelsradio.com. And if people want to get in touch with you, Steve, they can do so how? They can write to me at beatlesexaminer at gmail.com, or you can. 
catch up with me on Facebook under my name. I'm on there more than I care to admit, and I will very likely answer you personally. And I also am on Twitter, again, uh, under Beatles Examiner, and under I have actually a couple of accounts under my name. But I will answer. I'm very good. I try to answer as many you know comments as I get. So um, feel free to comment or talk to me or especially on Facebook. I'm very I'm very good about talking on Facebook. So So am I. Write to me too. Yep. yep. We're both very friendly guys. We're but we are. So we are. By all means get in touch with us. All right. Well this was fun reviewing right. the new Beatles BBC compilation. Mm -hmm. I'm Ken Michaels for things we said today, saying thanks so much for listening. And I'll see you next time. And this is Steve Marinucci saying I'll be listening to On Air, and see you next time. <laughs>